We're going to talk about the plantation now, the institution that was at the centre of the Atlantic slave system and the institution that drove the demand for enslaved labour that lay behind the slave trade. And I'd like to start by asking you to take a look at this picture. It's by the English artist James Hakewill of a plantation in the British island colony of Jamaica towards the beginning of the 19th century. Pause the video now to take a look at this. OK, hopefully you've had a good chance to take a look at this picture and those two detailed boxes that are next to it. You can see in the foreground enslaved people working in the fields on the sugar crop. They're harvesting it and they're loading it onto those mules or donkeys and taking it up that central path towards the works buildings in the middle of the picture where that sugar will be processed and made ready for export from the plantation um, across the Atlantic to market in Britain. So here in this picture, which we should remark, shows a very sanitised version of uh, the plantation. Hakewell was painting this for a planter to put on uh, his wall. And so it shows you the sort of picture of uh, uh, peaceful work on a plantation uh, with a beautiful background that that planter would want to look at. It doesn't show you the sort of brutal labour and punishment that we know was part and parcel of plantation life. So like any source, we should treat this um, critically, think about who made it and for who. But nonetheless, we should also recognise that it can reveal something to us about the, the character of sugar plantations and indeed of plantations more generally. We have enslaved people who, in this case, belong to the plantation and belong to the plantation owner, working there in his fields um, to harvest the main crop and to take it to the central works where it's processed for export. That is the essential rhythm of work on most plantations around the Atlantic world, either in the Caribbean or in North America. Now, there are all sorts of variations on the theme of the plantation, according to region, according to crop, but those are some of the main essentials. An enslaved workforce belonging to the property, tending to and harvesting a crop that is processed on the plantation for export and consumption elsewhere. Now, you'll remember that the plantation develops in large part after the 17th century sugar revolution in Barbados. And the kinds of um, uh, agricultural units that grow up, the plantations that develop in the years and after the sugar revolution, are incredibly capital intensive operations. They're extremely expensive for planters to buy and to run. You have to either be able to borrow a lot of money or have a lot of money of your own in order to set a plantation up. The workforce is incredibly expensive. Those works buildings are extremely expensive. And of course, planters were willing to invest and take the huge risk in investment in order to make vast profits from slave produced plantation exports. Plantations were also proto-industrial units of production. So here we see inside the boiling house of a Caribbean uh, sugar plantation. Again, a fairly sanitised scene, but nonetheless giving you a sense of the industrialised nature of this work. These are at the cutting edge of technology and manufacturing in the early modern world. The sugar plantations of the Caribbean uh, were some of the earliest and most um, technologically sophisticated pieces of industrial uh, machinery and production that existed um, long before the cotton mills of Lancashire transformed the British economy at the end of the 18th century. So these are incredibly modern economic units. You might associate slavery with the pre-modern, outdated forms of um, labour control and production. But in fact, 
the ways in which planters regimented their labour force and the kind of technology that they were using to process their crops meant that these, far from being outmoded, were at the cutting edge of technology for the time. So let's think a little then about the ways in which work was organised on a plantation and about the enslaved people forced to work on these properties. What we have here is another sanitised scene from a British Caribbean sugar plantation, again from the early 19th century. It illustrates once more work in the fields and plantation work was repetitive and extremely exhausting hard labour. One of the things that typically we tend to associate with slavery is brutal punishment. And um, quite rightly, we think about the whip as being a really important form of, of punishing and torturing enslaved people and keeping them to their work. It is extremely important, but nonetheless, as much as anything, it's the sheer physical grind of field labour that represents the, the true horror at the heart of slavery, essentially people being worked to death. Enslaved people are treated as units of labour. They are, of course, the property of their masters. Some of the most chilling ways in which you find this represented in the evidence is through documents like this one. This is uh, a page from a probate inventory these documents were put together in Jamaica following the death of a free white colonist and they were essentially just lists of all of the things, the property, so-called property, that that person owned at the point of their death. And so you find furniture, you find tools and plantation equipment, you find all sorts of things uh, and items, possessions that the, that person had owned during their lifetime. And of course... In the case of slaveholders, like the planters, you also find the names of enslaved people. And they are listed in these documents in the kind of ways that you see in front of you. Names, occupation and value. Listed um, often in groups of boys and girls and women, children. And all the time this uh, so-called property is being evaluated. So any item of property in an inventory list is given a cash value, including these enslaved people. So you find list of name after name, um, people like Dolly there, Field, uh, Weekly, £60, um, Natty, Field, £130, lists that go on for page after page after page. And this is a list of workers on a sugar plantation. So what was the daily experience like for people like this who were forced to work on a property producing, say, sugar in the British Caribbean? What I'd like you to do now is to take a look at this next slide and again to pause the video for a moment to read the quotation in front of you. This quote is from the diary of a man called Thomas Thistlewood, who was an English colonist in Jamaica from Lincolnshire, who arrived in the colony in 1750 and was fairly typical. Uh, a white man who went over, uh, got involved working on sugar plantations, managing enslaved people, and later on became a slaveholder and a property owner in his own right. There's nothing particularly unusual about Thistlewood, and certainly the practice of whipping was incredibly common on sugar estates. The other element of this punishment is less common, but what it underlines for you is the sheer amount of control that people like Thistlewood had over the enslaved people that they managed. They could basically do what they liked to them. And this was a really essential component of managing enslaved people and making plantations work. So some of the most important things for us to think about in terms of making a plantation work is violence and terror. The whip is ubiquitous and those things are absolutely essential to the work of someone like Thomas Thistlewood as a white man trying to manage enslaved people to do the work of planting, tending, harvesting and processing sugarcane on a Jamaican sugar estate.
but we should also think about some other factors as well. One of the characteristics of slavery in the Caribbean is large enslaved majorities. On an island like Jamaica, enslaved people outnumbered white people overall by about 10 to 1, and then that went up a great deal in the rural parishes where the plantations were to say 30 to 1 and on some big plantations enslaved people could outnumber whites like Thistlewood by anything up to 100 to 1. So how does slavery work in that kind of context? Well terror and violence are important but so too are techniques of divide and rule and you can see in front of you there a picture of an enslaved man with the role of a driver on a sugar estate. These were really important um, components of the management structure, these individuals. Enslaved people given privileges, um, including the right to, at the behest of white management, whip enslaved people on the estate, given privileges that would help the uh, the, the, the white management to control labour on the estate and with that went all sorts of um, enhanced status and perks. These were some of the ways in which uh, white managers were able to make sure that they could rule over huge numbers of enslaved people. Slaveholders would try to divide African ethnic groups against one another and they would try to also draw distinctions between locally born English-speaking enslaved people and new coming Africans. They also provided uh, privileges and perks, not just to drivers, but to other enslaved people on their properties in order to try to divide them and to try to make sure that there was never a concerted effort, that enslaved people never came together in order to try to challenge white authority. So terror is important, but so too are these tactics of division. So here we see a map of Jamaica, which was the single most important plantation colony in the British Empire during the 18th century. The most co important colony full stop in the British Empire during that period. You can see some of the names of the sugar estates around the edges of the island. Uh, most of them were on the low-lying coastal plains which is where some of the most fertile land for sugar existed. And also it was helpful to be near the coast so that the sugar could be quickly transported and then loaded onto ships for export. You can see, if we zoom in a little bit, um, some of the more of the names of those plantations on those low-lying coastal regions. And there is Lan Rumney, that estate that we started with in that colourful picture by James Hakewell. So I focus mostly on sugar and on the Caribbean, but it's important, of course, to remember that there are other plantations elsewhere in Anglophone America, which is the region that we're most interested in. I've mentioned coffee already. There is uh, tobacco plantations in the Chesapeake and rice in South Carolina and Georgia, as well as sugar in Louisiana. Now, the sugar plantations of the Caribbean were particularly large and the plantations for these other crops tended to be somewhat smaller. But in many ways they were similar to the sugar plantations. Captive slave workforces working in the fields to tend to crops that were centrally processed on the plantation for sale elsewhere. The most important crop in the United States, of, as we've mentioned, was cotton. And you can see in the map that's in front of you there, uh, the density of enslaved populations in the United States on the eve of the American Civil War. Those darker areas indicate uh, larger concentrations of enslaved people and essentially what that map gives you the contours of is the slave economy and much of that um, uh, slave economy in the uh, across the south particularly up the Mississippi River Valley in the middle there is cotton plantations making huge fortunes for many of the planters of the American South. We will finish by focusing on some of the defining characteristics of the Atlantic slave system that we've been introducing. It was a system that depended on exploitation and domination. At the heart of this system was the practice of one person owning another person 
as though they were an item of property. That's a, a central idea that underpins this trade in enslaved people and the uh, practice of slavery in the New World. That means that violence and terror were essential to the Atlantic slave system. Enslaved people were not persuaded to be enslaved. They were forced and they were kept enslaved through the brutal application of violence and terror. In the Atlantic case, ideas about racial difference are also essential to this system. In the Americas, certainly by the 18th century, blackness and slavery have become synonymous. Whiteness denotes freedom and enslaved people are almost exclusively black people. So the principle of, uh, of race and ideas about racial difference are really, really significant parts of this system and they begin to form part of how slaveholders justify it to themselves and to outside critics. They begin to create a fiction that African people are somehow suited to slavery. And this is one of the ways in which they justify their incredibly brutal but lucrative system. They also, as we've seen today, institute tactics of divide and rule in order better to rule over and control those enslaved people who they exploit. So a few other defining characteristics that we've seen today. This is a system that depends upon long distance migration. The most significant uh, overseas forced migration in human history. It's also a system that depends upon far-flung markets. You can see there in the picture enslaved people rolling a barrel of sugar onto a boat so that it can be loaded for exports to, to Britain, to Europe. And so in more ways than just the, the things that I talked about previously in this talk, in other ways this is an incredibly modern phenomenon, the Atlantic slave system. We can see in it the roots of globalisation, the geographical separation of production and manufacture from consumption. It's part of a far-flung system in which labour is taken from one part of the world and put to work in another, producing commodities that are consumed thousands of miles away by people who would never see or visit a sugar plantation and its enslaved workers. Finally, we should mention some other really necessary and important parts of the slave system. This was a violent and exploitative and deeply unequal system. But enslaved people were never simply passive victims. They would negotiate on plantations to try to get whatever improved conditions they were able to secure for themselves. They would also resist in all sorts of ways, sometimes successfully, sometimes less so. And it, there were also many, many examples of violent uprisings. Many of those were crushed, but the most famous, um, illustrated on the slide by the one of its leaders, Toussaint Louverture, the most famous slave uprising took place in French Saint-Domingue, the Haitian Revolution a revolution led by enslaved people in French Saint-Domingue that eventually led to the independence of that nation under a new black leadership uh, as the independent nation of Haiti. So this too, this story of resistance, is also part of the story that we're presenting about slavery and racism.